The Eternals Have Arrived from Academy Award winning director Chloe Zhao comes a film about unrelatable godlike characters who stand around and pose and have melodramatic really obvious philosophical debates. But don't worry there is action when they fight mindless CGI creatures and uh, they reference the DC Universe about as much as they reference the Marvel one. Uh, in a film that will leave you asking did Marvel really just make their first rotten film or did they just make their first DC film? I may have just shown my hand just there, but honestly, it's not that simple. I think we should acknowledge, though, that this is getting a far more negative reaction than any Marvel film up till now. And the question then is, why is that? And do I agree? And I want to start by saying, even if it makes me sound like a horrible Marvel shill, go ahead and call me that in the comments. I don't think Marvel have made a bad film up till now. I'm not saying their films are all amazing. I'm not saying they're all even good. But I found that at the very least, They've been generally entertaining and pretty consistent. Whether that's consistently fantastic or consistently middling is kind of up to the viewer. But nothing else, I've always managed to at least throw them on and be entertained, even if I'm watching them somewhat mindlessly. I have no problem re-watching them. But my first thought when I came out of The Eternals was, I don't think I need to see this one ever again. And I've been trying to figure out why that is. I think number one is that it's long and it feels long. I mean, this is the longest Marvel film aside from Avengers Endgame, which is just crazy. But the biggest offense of that is that it doesn't feel like it made the most of its time. There's an over-reliance on flashbacks. Half the film is about getting the band back together. Like this is some sort of Muppet movie or something. And it's only really in the second half of the movie that the film sort of figures out what it wants to be. And apparently it wants to be pretty dull. Eternal suffers from what I'm going to call the Dr. Manhattan problem, which is that if you have a sort of godlike, somewhat detached from humanity character, it's hard for the audience to relate to them, especially because they have this sort of existential ennui that just makes them pretty uninteresting. And the bigger problem with Eternals is the fact that pretty much all of our characters are like that. And to be fair, they try to combat that by having some of our characters, you know, grow a love for humanity or pose certain philosophical questions, but it doesn't work all that well, mainly because we've seen the kind of growing a love for humanity a million times before, and seemingly only half of the Eternals characters feel that way. And the other thing is that the philosophical questions are really, really obvious, and the answers they deliver are fairly trite. So because of that, it feels like the film really lacks substance, and that wouldn't be a problem. I don't really go to Marvel films expecting too much depth or substance, or indeed most blockbusters. But the problem is then that you need to have something to offer. Some decent action, some good characters, some laughs. Arguably stuff Marvel has all excelled at in the past. Here we have probably our least action focused MCU film ever. I mean there's just not a lot of exciting scenes and I'll be fine if the other elements were strong. But they're not really and I mean the action we get is okay I suppose but the problem is that the powers of the Eternals all feel a little bit too pedestrian and quite similar to each other and also just not very cinematic. They kind of remind me of the first Doctor Strange film where at times it did just feel like we were seeing flashing lights smash against each other through the use of CGI. And look, the CGI in the film is really, really good. Uh, well, except for one of the post credit scenes, you'll see a character there and you'll know what I'm talking about. But it just feels like the film is like being defiant about having anything exciting or any action scene. Like, we have what could be a really exciting action scene, and it just ends with a character being beaten over the head with a rock. And that's it. That's the end to your big fight scene. And I kind of was like, oh, I guess they're going to... That's the fake out and... No. <laughs> oh, well. I will say the climactic action scene did have its moments, even if it did kind of feel like what we got with other superhero films. But the rest of the action scenes are just them fighting these two-dimensional monster characters, the Deviants which never really get developed. I mean, I guess they spent the time developing the rest of the characters, sort of. Or else they were just leaving room for a villain to emerge towards the end of the movie. And it just makes the movie feel rather aimless. And yeah, there is a kind of a global threat, because isn't there always with these movies? But the problem is that there's no kind of immediate threat there, and it doesn't really manifest itself until we come towards the end of the film, and it means that there's not a lot of conflict or urgency until the end of the film. And that's probably why the rest of the film is slow, while at least the end was somewhat interesting. The pacing and the tone of the film are just sort of all over the place. Like, for example, the pacing, it starts pretty interestingly. Then it just slows to a crawl for a long, long time and rarely picks up that pace again. I mean, 
it's not helped by the fact we have so many flashbacks that really added nothing in my opinion. Like, they're meant to give us context, but it's like, oh, I wonder how Cersei and Icarus fell in love. I bet you there's a really interesting story there. Oh no, they just fell in love. Okay, right. Cool, that could have been interesting. I guess not. Uh, so, is there enough pivotal to the movie? Well, <laughs> not as much as you might expect, actually. So, I wonder why the Eternals went their separate ways. There must be a fascinating story behind that, or is it just exactly what we think it is? I mean, you told us they had a disagreement. Oh, you're going to show us the disagreement as well. Oh, and it's exactly what you think it is. Why? Great. Thanks for showing us that movie. Tonally, the movie is really strange, because when you picture Eternals, you probably think this big, crazy, cosmic, Kirby-esque epic because that's what the Eternals are. <laughs> but instead, we have something here that feels quite small and kind of naturalistic at times. Which means that the odd time that something big and cosmic does happen, that feels totally out of place for the audience. But that's the opposite of how the characters in the movie feel, which means it's further alienating us from those characters. Now the other problem, and this is a problem with many Marvel films, is the kind of abundance of jokes. And it doesn't bother me in a lot of Marvel films. And I'm not going to say this doesn't have the odd good joke. But they kind of work in the other movies because, you know, it's a light, bubbly, kind of fun time blockbuster. But this time they're going for this big epic. And it feels like they begrudgingly included jokes. And they just feel really weird and out of place, to be honest. Like, oh, we have these very kind of personality-less, detached characters, but oh, they can still crack wise every now and then. The movie rarely actually feels epic though. They incorporate a lot of world history. So they're trying to say like, hey, this is a time-spanning saga for the ages, but it's all in perfunctory flashbacks. So it never really worked for me. And you would assume that they want this kind of big scale for an epic film like this, but the scale with some exceptions is shockingly slight. I mean, they put in a few globe-trotting locations to make the movie kind of feel big. But a lot of locations feel remarkably similar. I mean, count how many desert landscapes are in this film. And yeah, look, sometimes the cinematography does excel. But the music is also totally forgettable. The colour palette is so drab. And it's like this movie can't help but remind you how boring it is. It feels like a film at all odds with itself like they were like we're going to be different we're not going to be like those other marvel films so they went slow and introspective and then somewhere along the way realized they actually had nothing to say and ended up with a lot of the marvel tropes anyway and in trying to fight against it they became the biggest offender of all like common complaints like paper thin villains forgettable action lack of any real consequence unremarkable visuals and music that's the sort of thing I'd normally defend the Marvel movies against. But I think they might all apply here. <laughs> Weirdly, I didn't think this review was going to be that negative until I sat down to write it. But if there is one positive to be taken away from this film, it's that even though the characters are underdeveloped, and there's definitely like way too many of them in the film, I did enjoy some of these characters and certainly the performances, even if they didn't really feel all that unique or original. I found her, I mean, I guess she's our lead of Cersei, played by Gemma Chan, to be really underwhelming. She didn't feel all that more important or interesting or developed than any of the other characters in the film, to be honest. So that was a bit of a dud. We have Icarus, played by Richard Madden. He was about as developed as the plot needed him to be. Um, yeah, he was He was fine. His uh, former Game of Thrones co-star, Kit Harrington, was barely in the film, to be honest. Uh, and Salma Hayek was in it less than I thought she'd be as well. Camille Nanjiani, I thought, made a, a pretty good comedic relief. I liked his scenes a lot, uh, even though it's weird how ripped he got and you'd never know it from actually watching the movie. But there you go. Sprite, I thought she was a lot of fun, um, even though she didn't really have a lot to do until, you know, the film needed her to do something, which, whatever, it felt a little bit forced, but sure, whatever. We have Phantos played by Brian Tyree Henry. I like Brian Tyree Henry, uh, and I thought the character had his moments, including a moment where the character is revealed to be gay. So Marvel finally committed to that, probably because the film was never going to be released in China anyway. We have uh, Druig and Macari. I liked their relationship and I thought they were pretty interesting uh, and I liked their scenes, even though they weren't in it all that much. But uh, I think the other problem there is that Barry Cohen's accent totally threw me. <laughs> Maybe it's just because I'm Irish. I found it a bit unsettling. Uh, Angelina Jolie, I thought she gave a very good performance. I thought the character was cool, uh, if a little shallow. But I did like the relationship she had with Don Lee. So those are the characters uh, of which there are far too many. And that's about it. I really didn't expect this review to be so negative, but here we are. 
Honestly, it's mostly just aggressively average and a bit directionless. And while it does introduce some cool characters into the MCU playground, their introduction is no doubt a messy one. And sure, maybe the film was saddled with unrealistic expectations because of the director, but it still misses the mark. From its tone and consistency and awkward pacing, to the fact that it's far too long with little to entertain or excite. There's just not a lot to love about the latest Marvel film. And while it's not as bad as you heard, it's certainly not as good as you hoped.